Okay, our next speaker is Tom Jones, and uh, he's already been in introduced a number of times today, so uh, please welcome Tom Jones, who will give us our next talk. Hi again. Um, this talk is about novel ecosystems, and this is part of restoration in the Anthropocene. And uh, there's a new book that just came out this month by Wiley Blackwell Press. It costs $80, but in the back table I put 50 copies uh, for free of Chapter 26, which is Plant Materials for Ecosystems, for Novel Ecosystems, which I authored. And if you run out, you can always email me for any of these publications, and I'll send you a PDF. So the title of the book is Novel Ecosystems Intervening in the New Ecological World Order. Uh, and this is this actually one of the authors behind that is this Harris, the, uh, Jim Harris that, that uh, Erica just mentioned. But the three editors of the book are Richard Hobbs, Eric Higgs, and Carol Hall. So I'll be giving you an overview of this book and an introduction to novel ecosystems because you're going to be hearing more and more about novel ecosystems, I believe. And this is our leader of this novel ecosystems movement, Richard Hobbs. He's a Scot by birth. Um, he's educated in the U.S. and then he got his Ph.D. at the University of Aberdeen, but not the one in Idaho. <laughs> he followed that with a postdoc at Stanford, but in the rest of his career, uh, his very eminent career, he's been in Australia uh, and he's received an Australian Laureate Award for Science, and he's also editor-in-chief of the primary restoration journal called Restoration Ecology. Uh, and this is the group at the workshop where this book was birthed. This is on South Pender Island, which is just across the U.S. border uh, from Washington State. Uh, so a little less than two years ago, we met at this place, this resort called Poets Cove. And you can see the various countries that were represented uh, there at the meeting. So uh, some things about the book itself. The book was not written to champion novel ecosystems. Now, novel ecosystems are things that uh, make some folks quite nervous. Um, but others are excited about the possibilities. The way Richard Hopps refers to it is we're getting more and more lemons, and we have to start figuring out how to make lemonade. So you can just think about that. Instead, the purpose of the book is to provide a better understanding of novel ecosystems in order to improve their management, as the authors expect novel ecosystems continue to expand. And this all has to do with the Anthropocene. With a few exceptions, all statements and concepts in this talk are taken directly from the book. So now, you're really wanting to know, what is a novel ecosystem? So here's a rather lengthy uh, definition that the group came up with. A physical system of abiotic, biotic, and social components and their interactions that by virtue of human influence differ from those that prevailed historically, having a tendency to self-organize and manifest novel qualities without intensive human management. So note that they are caused in some way or another intentionally or inadvertently by human activity, but they don't require ongoing human management uh, to persist. They take on a life of their own, so to speak. Okay, they're novel in the sense that um, they haven't existed before in the history of the planet, uh, but, but in the course of the history of the planet, there have always been novel ecosystems. Uh, because of geologic changes and this sort of thing. Uh, but the ones we're talking about today uh, probably never occurred before. Novel ecosystems are not ecosystems that would have been present in the past. Ones that are managed intensively, for example, agriculture for some other use, or ones that are managed for historical reproduction. That's what we call classical restoration. So that's a difference there. So there are several drivers of novel ecosystems. 
land, land use change, climate change, invasive species, loss of critical species, over-exploitation of natural resources, and a modified biophysical environment, for example, soils, fire regime, hydrological function, or nitrogen deposition. So you can see how every one of these is uh, caused either intentionally or unintentionally by man. And that's, one, that's part of the definition of novel ecosystems, as you, as you just heard. So getting back to this idea, categories of novelty. First, inadvertent. And here are a couple of examples of uh, things that have gone on. They weren't intentional, uh, but, but they affect the ecosystems. Uh, also deliver. The in, deliberate introduction of exotic species, extraction of resources, for example, mining or logging. Uh, assisted migration. We heard about this yesterday where plants or animals were moved to a new site to try and rescue them from potential extinction. And sometimes uh, there's uh, uh, something that's done deliberately, but the consequences were not intended. There's some unintended consequences. For example, uh, we heard about legacy effects of the old dry farms, uh, abandoned management practice, some sort of human legacy, something that ended a long time ago, but we still see its impacts today. Uh, novel ecosystems can be said to have three essential features. First, they have to be different in terms of ecosystem composition, structure, or function. Second, um, there are, they reflect thresholds or tipping points, and Erica spoke a lot about these, uh, for these above in the previous bullet point, that are irreversible with current technology. As, as Erica said, it's, you can't just go back. It's not an easy thing. Uh, third, uh, novel ecosystems are self-organized and they persist. So this, as I mentioned before, they don't need human management to perpetuate their existence. Once they're there, they're going to continue to be there whether we like it or not. <clears throat> and then I want to mention three foundational concepts of novel ecosystems. The first is Henry Gleason's individualistic concept of the plant association. This is an idea that goes back to the 1920s, but it didn't really become popular until uh, Dr. Gleason had almost passed away in the 1970s. This is the idea that the plants found on a particular site are a rather uh, random consequence of the conditions of the site, the environment, uh, the weather, uh, and whether uh, propagules, uh, seeds, for example, were introduced to the site. Um, this seems kind of logical, but contrast this with uh, the idea that you may be familiar with of Henry Clements in the same day, and he believed in, in the climax system, and there was an inevitable movement towards climax through pioneer species. And, uh, the, the successional pattern was predetermined, preordained. Uh, rather than being random. So uh, more and more ecologists now pretty much have, have adopted these ideas of Gleason. Uh, in many cases, uh, they consider them to be more important than, than the ideas of Clements, which held sway for you know, 50 or more years. The second concept is pervasive human-caused ecological change. The idea is and shortly, there will be no place on the planet that can escape this human footprint. It doesn't have to be on the site. It could be hundreds or thousands of miles away, witness global change, uh, climate. It doesn't have to be something that occurred right there. Uh, it could have moved across the, through the atmosphere. And the third is the biotic, abiotic tether. This is the idea that when the biology of the site changes, it in turn has an impact on the abiotic component of the site. Um, for example, the soils, the hydrology, uh, these sort of things. And that abiotic component in turn impacts the biotic component. They're tethered to one another. So if one is modified, the other is modified, and you end up with a novel ecosystem.
And so there you see very uh, several in the center there, several different um, sorts of categories and mechanisms that, that uh, uh, drive this uh, tether that connect the biotic and the abiotic components. Neat, the novel ecosystems, as I mentioned, are increasingly prevalent. This is a quote from the book. Human-caused environmental change is here to stay and will continue to affect the world's ecosystems. Uh, I got that twice. <laughs> By rearranging biota and altering abiotic conditions. Worldwide, novel ecosystems are expected to continue to increase in extent and degree of novelty. And so many people are very concerned about this uh, because this kind of implies that restoration is not really what they had in mind. And we've heard er allusions to this earlier, particularly from Erica, um, as you recall, that um, talking about the importance of, of uh, function as opposed to structure or the plant species that are, that are present. This is something we're going to be having to live with. Um, and there's a diversity of attitudes out there um, regarding this. It's controversial. So what is, now that you know what novel ecosystems are, let me explain what they are not about. I, when I presented this talk in Washington, D.C. Uh, last summer, uh, there was a guy in, in the audience who was a policy person. He was actually an intern working for the BLM at the time. He was going to go back to, uh, to get a master's in policy in New York State. Um, he he talked, spoke to me during the break and he said, you know, I've read all about novel ecosystems before I came today. Somebody gave me that assignment because they knew you were going to talk. Um, but this is the one thing that I, I was new in what I heard today. This is